David and Solomon. Preface. The following quotation, from Jacob, 2 colon 23-24 in the Book of Mormon has often been quoted by anti-Mormons, semi-upstate Mormons, reorganites, and other offshoots against plural marriage. But the word of God burthens me, because of your grosser crimes. For behold, thus saith the Lord, this people begin to wax in iniquity, they understand not the scriptures, for they seek to excuse themselves in committing whoredoms, because of the things which were written concerning David, and Solomon his son. Behold, David and Solomon truly had many wives and concubines, which thing was abominable before me, saith the Lord. Jacob 2 colon 23-24. Plural marriage was being lived by many of the biblical prophets, priests, kings, and patriarchs during the same time period that this scripture was written. The Old Testament is a continuous record of men who lived polygamy during those 4,000 years. Even Moses received laws pertaining to the way this marriage style should be lived. For many others it was not intended, because they were not sufficiently qualified. Thus this passage in Jacob refers to them. Since the scripture in Jacob has been seldom properly explained, this pamphlet is intended to help clarify it and explain the apparent contradictions surrounding the polygamy of David and Solomon. A few verses the majority. From priest to politician, we hear the cry of sin, outlawed, immoral, and other epithets depicting plural marriage. Many people believe that it is an evil, adulterous, and wicked practice. Most of these objections, however, originate from those who have not sufficiently read or studied the reasons men and women have practiced this unpopular marriage lifestyle. The world is supposed to be more wicked today than it ever has been, and according to the Book of Mormon that churches, yeah, even every one, have become polluted Mormon 8.36. The Lord has said in our dispensation, and my vineyard has become corrupted every whit, and there is none which doeth good save it be a few. D and C 33:4. It is evident today that the United States, the state of Utah, the Protestants, Catholics, and the Mormons are generally all opposed to plural marriage which does not qualify them to be in the category of a few. On the other hand, there are certainly only a few of the nation's population that believe and practice the principle. Is it possible, then, that this few may be right and the majority could be wrong and corrupted? The basis of many arguments against plural marriage was God's rebuke against two kings in Israel, as previously quoted, David and Solomon truly had many wives and concubines, which thing was abominable before me, saith the Lord. Jacob 2:24. But yet we also read in Mormon scripture that, David's wives and concubines were given unto him of me, by the hand of my servant Nathan. D and C 132:39. How can these two seemingly contradictory passages both be true? What makes this even more perplexing is the statement by the prophet Samuel to Saul, when he was chastising Saul for not keeping God's commandments. The Lord hath sought him a man, after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, 1 Samuel 13 verse 14. The Apostle Paul explained further. He raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony, and said, I have found David the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Of this man's seed hath God according to his promise raised unto Israel a saviour, Jesus. Acts 13 verses 22 to 23. How do we explain God's choosing a man, after his own heart, to be an honored king over Israel, and to have posterity for the lineage of Jesus, yet say he lived in abomination? The answer to this puzzle is that both Jacob 2:24 and D and C 1:32 colon 39 cannot be true at the same time. When Nathan gave David plural wives, it was with God's consent and favor, but later when David took wives against God's will, then he was unworthy of them and it became an abomination. After David had become an adulterer and a murderer, he was not worthy of plural marriage, so it became an abomination to him. Even partaking of the holy sacrament can be the means of condemnation for the unworthy, for he eateth 
and drinketh damnation to himself. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 29, For the individual who is pure, it is a blessing, for the wicked, it is condemnation. When David and Solomon were in good favor with the Lord, he blessed them in every way, including their wives, but when they apostatized, they were no longer worthy of those good women. Plural marriage would be an abomination, for any wicked man it would have been an abomination for Hitler, Stalin or Mao Tse Ting to live plural marriage so, it would be for any man who apostatized from the truth. Plural marriage was never an abomination for good men such as Abraham, Jacob, Moses, Gideon, etc. And that is why God never condemned them for it. Therefore, let's look further into the lives of David and Solomon, and see just how and why they warranted such criticism from the Lord. King David The life of David can be divided into two main parts, one, his rise from the lowly shepherd boy to his kingship over Israel, and two, his subsequent great fall. No young man had ever achieved such fame and honor with the Lord as did David, nor did any man show such suffering and mourning over his sins. In battle, on the throne, and in his home, he was blessed by the Lord, who protected him and even spoke to him. Yet he later sinned so grievously that David's only consolation was that he felt the Lord would not leave my soul in hell. Psalm 16 verse 10. It should be understood, then, at what point in David's life he transgressed the law of the Lord. How could it have been in his early plural marriages, as the Lord said, David's wives and concubines were given unto him of me, and in none of these things did he sin against me save in the case of Uriah and his wife. D and C 132:39. Again we have a seemingly contradictory statement from the Lord when he speaks of David's plural marriage as an abomination, and then again says that through plural marriage a man shall inherit thrones, kingdoms, principalities, and power, dominions, and then shall they be gods. D&C 132-19-20 It is very clear to see that all good things can become bad. It can be stated that the better, the more powerful and more glorious something may be, the more damaging, disastrous, or damning it can become. For instance, a fire may give life-sustaining warmth to a house, or it can be the cause of burning it down. Atomic power can light up a whole city, or it can destroy it in a blast. And so it is with plural marriage it can exalt a man or be the means to condemn and damn him. The prophet Joseph said it well. It signifies, then, that the ordinances must be kept in the very way God has appointed, otherwise their priesthood will prove a cursing instead of a blessing. TPJS, page 169. David lived both honorably and dishonorably, but not at the same time. He lived polygamy in righteousness and later in unrighteousness. When he first entered into marriage with plural wives, he was blessed, but when he became a wicked man, he was cursed. For a while David was a man after God's own heart, but when he lusted after Uriah's wife, he no longer lived after God's own heart. When David was living a righteous life, God abundantly blessed him. I gave thee thy master's souls, house, and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and I gave thee the house of Israel and Judah, and if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. 2 Samuel 12 verse 8. Notice here that the Lord is giving plural wives to a man who is a polygamist already, and says he is willing to give more. Surely, God could have donated those women to some poor souls who didn't have a wife especially if he considered polygamy to be evil. This is a good example of how the Lord wants good and honorable men to have wives rather than those who are unworthy of them. When David turned from the Lord, as Saul did, the Lord took them away from him also. When the prophet Nathan came to David with the story of the shepherd with many sheep who slew a shepherd and took his only lamb, David was furious and said the man should be condemned to death. Nathan then said that he, David, was the man. David confessed, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan then pronounced a curse upon David and his household and for what? Certainly not polygamy, as the Lord stated. 
Wherefore host thou despised the commandment of the Lord, to do evil in his sight? Thou bast killed. Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and host slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thin house, because thou hast despised me, and host taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. 2 Samuel 12 verses 9-10 to To further condemn David, the Lord said, I will take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. 2 Samuel 12 verse 11 David became unworthy of his wives, but his neighbor apparently was worthy. Polygamy was not the issue it was David's sin with Bathsheba and Uriah. When David became guilty of adultery and murder, it was then that the sword of vengeance came upon David, his illegitimate son died, his daughter was ravished by a half-brother, his eldest son, Amnon, was murdered, a rebellion took place against him by his son, and Absalom was killed. Both the sword and sorrow continued to plague the house of David. Nathan the prophet was the man who gave David his plural wives, because at that time he was a righteous man, and it was Nathan who later came and took them away when David sinned. This should have been enough for David to learn his lesson, but he multiplied wives to himself right up to the last day of his life. These women were not given to him by the prophet or by God, but by his own choosing and the efforts of others. See 1 Kings 1 verses 1 to 3. The Lord saw nothing wrong with David's having many wives while he was a righteous man, but when he became an adulterer and murderer, then he was condemned in the sight of all Israel. It is an abomination for wicked men to live plural marriage. King David was no exception. As a murderer and adulterer, he had no right to take any more wives, neither was he worthy of those he already had. During the time David was an innocent man and was living plural marriage, before the Bathsheba incident, the Lord said to him, I was with thee whithersoever thou wentest, and have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight, and have made thee a great name, like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. 2 Samuel 7 verse 9. But after David committed adultery and murder, the Lord said, Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house. 2 Samuel 12 verses 10 to 11. And because of David's sins, the Lord caused a pestilence to come upon Israel resulting in the death of 70,000 men. And David spake unto the Lord when he saw the angel that smote the people, and said, Lo, I have sinned, and I have done wickedly. 2 Samuel 24 verse 17. The Lord never let David forget the incident with Bathsheba and Uriah, and from then on, David suffered hell in all its ugly forms. King Solomon The Lord mentions Solomon's polygamy in conjunction with David, so let's briefly review his life and see what caused his downfall. This son of David lived in luxury all his life. He never knew hunger, poverty, and war as so many of the Israelites had experienced. He was raised with the best education, in the shadow of his father's fame and fortune, during a very peaceful and prosperous period of Israel's history. He followed in the footsteps of his father and rose to the kingly throne over Israel. He ruled in righteousness so well, in fact, that the Lord spoke to him, guided his life and even appeared to him twice. See 1 Kings 3 verse 5 and 9 colon 2. Solomon so pleased the Lord that he was blessed with wisdom, riches and honor above all other men. He had everything that any man could want. Solomon's desire was to make Israel a holy nation, with a royal priesthood, and build a temple to God. Under his wise counsel, the nation of Israel and the city of Jerusalem began to prosper and receive blessings that it had never before known. For the first time the nation had a permanent national worship center in the capital city. The presence of the temple was to dominate the religious life 
and thinking of the Israelites, until its destruction, in 587-6 BC. Even then it did not fade out. The structure was rebuilt and later thoroughly remodeled until again destroyed in AD 70. The influence of the priests became more powerful, and the festivals became regularized the presence of the temple enhanced the city of Jerusalem itself, so that it became known as the city of God. The teaching function of the priests helped to disseminate the ancient truths revealed by God more widely in Israel the temple became a powerful unifying force. Zondervan's Pictorial Encyclopedia of the Bible, 5 47778. While Solomon reigned as king, he was blessed in both temporal and spiritual things until it was looked upon as the Golden Age for Israel. He acquired more land, ratified peace with many nations, and acquired fabulous wealth. It was during this rise to fame and fortune that Solomon also acquired several wives. Some of them were sureties for the treaties that he had signed with other national rulers. One of these wives, an Ammonitis, was to become the mother of Rehoboam, Solomon's successor. This kind of marriage arrangement in Israel was not uncommon both before and after Solomon's time, nor did the Lord condemn Solomon, or any other king in Israel for condoning it. However, there were specific restrictions, both as to particular nations and races, which Solomon initially respected. So the Lord continued to bless him and the Israelites. The temple was a project in which God seemed particularly interested so much, so that he gave specific instructions on how it should be built. The Ark of the Covenant was placed in the temple, and at the conclusion of its construction, God indicated his acceptance of both Solomon and the temple by making his presence known there by a special cloud. We read in 1 Kings 8 verses 42-43 that the temple would also be used to attract and convert people of many nations to the true God of Israel. Strange, isn't it, that God would allow the chief architect and builder of such a significant structure to be a polygamist especially since he was to act as a representative and example to the people of many other nations. As further evidence of the Lord's pleasure with this polygamist, Solomon, and all that he was doing, the Lord appeared to Solomon the second time, 1 Kings 9 verse 2, after the temple was finished, and told him how he would continue to bless him and the house of Israel. The house of Israel, remember, consists of the descendants of Jacob, the polygamist. The leaders of many nations did come to hear his, Solomon's, wisdom, which God had put in his heart, 1 Kings 10 verse 24. Even the queen of Sheba fell weak at the sight of the temple and the influence of Solomon, and she left him huge amounts of rare spices, jewels and 120 talents, 1,224 pounds of gold. And when the queen of Sheba had seen all Solomon's wisdom and the house that he had built, there was no more spirit in her. And she said to the king, It was a true report that I heard in mine own land of thy acts and of thy wisdom. Howbeit I believed not the words, until I came, and mine eyes had seen it, and behold, the half was not told me. Thy wisdom and prosperity exceedeth the fame which I heard happy are thy men, happy are these thy servants, which stand continually before thee, and that hear thy wisdom. Blessed be the Lord thy God, which delighted in thee, to set thee on the throne of Israel. 1 Kings 10 verses 4-9 The temple in Jerusalem, with Solomon as the overseer, became the show and tell Mecca for the whole house of Israel. Indeed it was the international visitors' center for the Lord. People from many nations came in awe and new respect for God's dealings with his chosen people and to learn of him and his ways. In all of these things, God seemed satisfied with his servant, Solomon. However, there came a time in which Solomon, like his father, displeased the Lord. It was regarding his dealings and intermarriages with those of certain other nations the very thing that the Lord had warned him about. There were some nations that God had put restrictions upon regarding Israel. All other nations were allowed to come and visit, become converted to the house of Israel, and to live and marry among the Israelites. But it was with these forbidden nations that Solomon lost his judgment and reason-making both political and religious alliances. 
He even took their women as wives. Thus, the Lord warned Solomon of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clove unto these in love. 1 Kings 11 verse 2 It was the influence of these women, not the others, that turned away his heart. It was when he built altars for these strange gods of Chemosh, Ashtoreth, and Molech to satisfy the desires of these strange wives or concubines, that Solomon did that which the Lord had forbidden. And likewise did he for all his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon, because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice, and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which the Lord commanded. 1 Kings 11 verses 8 to 10. So the Lord told Solomon that he would take his kingdom away from him and give it to another Rehoboam, another polygamist. If Solomon's great sin was polygamy, surely the Lord wouldn't take away his kingdom and then give it to another polygamist. But Solomon, with all that wisdom, lost it when he took to wife those women who were from the forbidden nations and allowed them to desecrate the temple of God. It was these particular women, not the others, who were unconverted and subverted the temple with idols, false images, and wicked practices. Solomon allowed the house of God to become a den of heathens. He was no longer the wisest man in the world he didn't even use common sense. Even the polygamist Brigham Young proved to be wiser than Solomon, for he never allowed any heathen practices into the temple of God. Consider the follies that Solomon tolerated from some of these forbidden women. Of the numerous deities to which his foreign wives turned his heart, perhaps the best known in the ancient world was Ashtoreth, called the Abomination of the Sidonians, 1 Kings 11 verses 5 and 33, since her cult was early established among the Phoenicians. This fertility goddess, known as Astarte among the Greeks and as Ishtar in Babylonia, was the protagonist of sexual love and war in Babylonia and Assyria. Her degraded moral character is revealed by the Ugaritic literature from Ras Shamra. She is pictured on a seal found at Bethel where her name is given in hieroglyphic characters. Solomon thus courted disaster by this reams. Unger's Bible Dictionary, page 103. Foreign marriages brought foreign religions, and the king compromised the convictions, which he had expressed in his dedicatory prayer for the Temple, I. Kings 8 23. 27. By engaging in syncretistic worship to placate his wives. This violent breach of Israel's covenant could not go unpunished. Illustrated Bible Dictionary, Volume 3, 1472. So Solomon apostatized from the God of his fathers by introducing the heathen gods of wicked nations and accepting their practices. It was for this reason that his polygamy was an abomination. Both David and Solomon transgressed the laws, changed the ordinances, and broke the everlasting covenant, for which they suffered the punishments of God. Their sins brought death, sorrow and captivity to their own houses and the whole house of Israel. As apostates, they received the curses of God while they lived and even God's judgments have followed them beyond the grave. As the Lord said, David's wives and concubines were given unto him of me, but he committed such sins that he path fallen from his exaltation, and received his portion, and he shall not inherit them out of the world. D and C 132:39. Thus David and Solomon did an abominable became an adulterer and murderer, while Solomon transformed the temple of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob into a house of strange gods for heathens. No longer were they worthy of an eternal marriage covenant with any women, hence, it was an abomination for them to continue living plural marriage, and they lost the right to have any wives. Jacob's Message to the Nephites Jacob, son of Lehi, delivered a very pertinent sermon instructing the Nephites of his day, and referred to the polygamy of David and Solomon. To understand the circumstances and reasons for Jacob's discourse, 
it is necessary to set the stage as Jacob saw it. We need to understand the kind of people he was talking to, or we will not understand why he forbid them to live plural marriage. Was he talking to a people who were righteous like Abraham, Jacob, Moses, etc., or was he talking to a people who had transgressed the commandments of the Lord similar to what David and Solomon had done? Jacob described. The people of Nephi, under the reign of the second king, began to grow hard in their hearts, and indulged themselves in wicked practices, such as like unto David of old desiring many wives and concubines, and also Solomon, his son. Jacob 1 15. It is apparent that David and Solomon were lusting after women, and used plurality of wives for their wicked desires. To continue. But behold, hearken ye unto me, and know that by the help of the all-powerful Creator of heaven and earth I can tell you concerning your thoughts, how that ye are beginning to labor in sin, which sin appeareth very abominable unto me, yea, and abominable unto God. Yea, it grieveth my soul and causeth me to shrink with shame before the presence of my Maker, that I might testify unto you concerning the wickedness of your hearts. But, notwithstanding the greatness of the task, I must do according to the strict commands of God, and tell you concerning your wickedness and abominations, in the presence of the pure in heart, and the broken heart, and under the glance of the piercing eye of the Almighty God. And the hand of providence hath smiled upon you most pleasingly, that you have obtained many riches, and because some of you have obtained more abundantly than that of your brethren ye are lied up in the pride of your hearts, and wear stiff necks and high heads, because of the costliness of your apparel. And persecute your brethren, because ye suppose that ye are better than they. And now, my brethren, do ye suppose that God justifieth you in this thing? Behold, I say unto you, Nay. But he condemneth you, and if ye persist in these things his judgments must speedily come unto you. Zero that he would rid you from this iniquity and abomination. And, zero that ye would listen unto the word of his commands, and let not this pride of your hearts destroy your souls. But the word of God burthens me because of your grosser crimes. For behold, thus saith the Lord, this people begin to wax in iniquity, they understand not the scriptures, for they seek to excuse themselves in committing whoredoms, because of the things which were written concerning David, and Solomon his son. Behold, David and Solomon truly had many wives and concubines, which thing was abominable before me, saith the Lord. Wherefore, thus saith the Lord, I have led this people forth out of the land of Jerusalem, by the power of mine arm, that I might raise up unto me a righteous branch from the fruit of the loins of Joseph. Wherefore, I the Lord God will not suffer that this people shall do like unto them of old. Live plural marriage unrighteously, Jacob 2,5-6, 10, 13-14, 16, 23-26. Obviously the people at that time were living in whoredoms and practicing plural marriage unrighteously and rather than have such a sacred principle abused as it was by. David and Solomon, the Lord instructed Jacob to tell the people. For there shall not any man among you have save it be one wife, and concubines and he shall have none. For I, the Lord God, delight in the chastity of women, and whoredoms are an abomination before me, thus saith the Lord of hosts. Wherefore, this people shall keep my commandments, saith the Lord of hosts, or cursed be the land for their sakes. For I will, saith the Lord of hosts, raise up seed unto me, I will command my people, otherwise they shall hearken unto these things. Jacob 2 30 We can see the results of the wickedness of these Nephites by reading further in Jacob. For behold, I, the Lord, have seen the sorrow, and heard the mourning of the daughters of my people in the land of Jerusalem, yea, and in all the lands of my people, because of the wickedness and abominations of their husbands. 2.31 Behold, ye have done greater iniquities than the Lamanites, our brethren. Ye have broken the hearts of your tender wives, and lost the confidence of your children, because of your bad examples before them, and the sobbings of their hearts ascend up to God against you. And because of the strictness of the word of God, which cometh down against you, many hearts died, pierced with deep wounds. 2.35 
But woe, woe, unto you that are not pure in heart, that are filthy this day before God, for except ye repent the land is cursed for your sakes, and the Lamanites, which are not filthy like unto you, nevertheless they are cursed with a sore cursing, shall scourge you even unto destruction. 3 colon 3. Behold, the Lamanites your brethren, whom ye hate, because of their filthiness and the cursing which hath come upon their skins, are more righteous than you, for they have not forgotten the commandment of the Lord, which was given unto our fathers that they should have save it were one wife, and concubines they should have none. And there should not be whoredoms committed among them. 3 colon 5. 0 My brethren, I fear that unless ye shall repent of your sins that their skins will be whiter than yours, when ye shall be brought with them before the throne of God. 3 colon 8. Wherefore, ye shall remember your children, how that ye have grieved their hearts, because of the example that ye have set before them, and also, remember that ye may, because of your filthiness, bring your children unto destruction, and their sins be heaped upon your heeds at the last day. 3.10. Referring to verse 3 colon 5, the Lord has occasionally given the command to live monogamy, as in the case of Lehi, or when dealing with an unrighteous people. In these cases it would be a sin for the people concerned to live the higher law of polygamy, because they would be disobeying the Lord. The Lamanites had been commanded to live monogamy, and they had been obeying the law at that level. Yet the Nephites, also under that monogamous command given to Father Lehi, had taken it upon themselves to live polygamy, and had done so unrighteously, abusing that higher law and turning it into whoredoms and self-gratification. Thus they brought upon themselves the greater condemnation. At this time, then, the Lamanites were more righteous than the Nephites, whose transgressions became an abomination to them just as they did to David and Solomon. It is interesting to interject here, that in 1890 when the manifesto was issued, if it did come from the Lord as many people claim, it would have been for the same reason that the Lord had discontinued plural marriage on rare occasions in the past because of the unworthiness of the people. Is that the message for us as a church today? To summarize the kind of people Jacob was talking to. 1. They labored in sin. 2. They had wickedness in their hearts. 3. They were committing abominations. 4. They had pride in their hearts. 5. They wore stiff necks and high heads. 6. They wore costly apparel. 7. They persecuted their brethren. 8. They supposed they were better than others. 9. They were about to receive God's judgments. 10. They understood not the scriptures. 11. They were committing whoredoms. Is it any wonder, then, why Jacob instructed them not to live plural marriage? Has a similar condition of worldliness, pride and carnal pleasures existed for the past 100 plus years within the LDS Church? Jacob was talking to a people who were not worthy to live that sacred law nor any other higher priesthood law. It was impossible for them to raise up a righteous seed, as the Lord was desirous that they should do. Therefore, they were prevented from these blessings, and their destruction and overthrow by the Lamintes was foretold. It is important, then, to recognize the similarities that existed between the polygamy eventually lived by David and Solomon, and that of the people of Nephi at the time of Jacob. Plural marriage intended for the righteous. It is apparent that the Lord prefers to choose those righteous people whom he desires to live plural marriage, depending on their worthiness. Orson Pratt very appropriately explained this practice. But, notwithstanding that he, Solomon, was so highly blessed and honored of the Lord, there was room for him to transgress and fall, and in the end he did so. For a long time the Lord blessed Solomon, but eventually he violated that law which the Lord had given forbidding Israel to take wives from the idolatrous nations, and some of these wives succeeded in turning his heart from the Lord and induced him to worship the heathen gods, and the Lord was angry with him and, as it is recorded in the Book of Mormon, considered the acts of Solomon an abomination in his sight. Let us now come to the record in the Book of Mormon, when the Lord led forth Lehi and Nephi, and Ishmael and his two sons and five daughters out of the land of Jerusalem to the land of America, the males and females were about equal in number. There were Nephi, Sam, Laman and Lemuel, 
the four sons of Lehi, and Zoram, brought out of Jerusalem. How many daughters of Ishmael were unmarried? Just five. Would it have been just under these circumstances, to ordain plurality among them? No. Why? Because the males and females were equal in number, and they were all under the guidance of the Almighty, hence it would have been unjust, and the Lord gave a revelation that only one on record I believe in, which a command was ever given to any branch of Israel to be confined to the monogamic system. In this case the Lord, through his servant Lehi, gave a command that they should have but one wife. The Lord had a perfect right to vary his commands in this respect according to circumstances, as he did in others, as recorded in the Bible. There we find that the domestic relations were governed according to the mind and will of God and were varied according to circumstances, as he thought proper. By and by, after the death of Lehi, some of his posterity began to disregard the strict law that God had given to their father, and took more wives than one, and the Lord put them in mind, through his servant Jacob, one of the sons of Lehi, of this law, and told them that they were transgressing it, and then referred to David and Solomon as having committed abomination in his sight. The Bible also tells us that they sinned in the sight of God, not in taking wives legally, but only in those they took illegally, in doing which they brought wrath and condemnation upon their heads. But because the Lord dealt thus with the small branch of the house of Israel that came to America, under their peculiar circumstances, there are those at the present day who will appeal to this passage in the Book of Mormon as something universally applicable in regard to man's domestic relations. The same God that commanded one branch of the house of Israel in America to take but one wife when the numbers of the two sexes were about equal, gave a different command to the hosts of Israel in Palestine. But let us see the qualifying clause given in the Book of Mormon on T.T. Subject after having reminded the people of commandment delivered by Lehi, in regard to monogamy, the Lord says dash, for if I will raise up seed unto me I will command my people, otherwise they shall hearken unto these things. That is, if I will raise up seed among my people of the house of Israel, I will give them a commandment on the subject. But if I do not give this commandment, they shall hearken to the law which I give unto their father Lael, that is the meaning of the passage, and this very passage goes to prove that plurality was a principle God did approve under circumstances when it was authorized by him. JD 13 191 192, October 7, 1869. It is important to understand the conditions upon which plural marriage should be lived or not lived. If God commands his people to live it, they should do so, but if he commands them not to live it, then they are under condemnation if they do. If God does command people not to live it as he has done on rare occasions, it is because of their unworthiness. But many prophets and righteous saints have very definitely received a commandment to live that law. In this last dispensation, for example, the prophet Joseph Smith received a revelation directing him and the saints to obey plural marriage. He knew that he had no other choice, but in his anguish and trial over it, he declared. They accuse me of polygamy, and of being a false prophet, and many other things which I do not now remember, but I am no false prophet, I am no imposter, I have had no dark revelations, I have had no revelations from the devil, I made no revelations, I have got nothing up of myself. The same God that has thus far dictated me and directed me and strengthened me in this work, gave me this revelation and commandment on celestial and plural marriage, and the same God commanded me to obey it. He said to me that unless I accepted it and introduced it, and practiced it, one, together with my people, would be damned and cut off from this time henceforth. And they say why one do so, they will kill me, oh, what shall I do? If I dc, not r, underscore, t plus, e2, one shall be damned with my people. If I do teach it, and practice it, and urge it, they say they will kill me, and I know they will but, said he, we have got to observe it. It is an eternal principle, and was given by way of commandment, and not by way of instruction. Contributor 5 colon 259. See also DHC 6 colon 280281. 
However, many years later John Taylor commented on the weaknesses and failings of the saints and was afraid that they would someday reject it. He warned. What would be necessary to bring about the results nearest the hearts of the opponents of Mormonism? Simply to renounce, abrogate, or apostatize from the new and everlasting covenant of marriage in its fullness. Were the church to do that as an entirety, God would reject the saints as a body. The authority of the priesthood would be withdrawn with its gifts and powers, and there would be no more heavenly recognition of the administrations. The heavens would permanently withdraw themselves, and the Lord would raise up another people of greater valor and stability, for his work must, according to his unalterable decrees, go forward, for the time of the second coming of the Saviour is near, even at the doors. Des. News, April 23, 1885. The Lord had also confirmed this previously in a revelation to Joseph Smith which indicated that men could be prophets, revelators, and workers of miracles, yet if they refused to obey his commands, even plural marriage, they would be condemned. Although a man may have many revelations, and have power to do many mighty works, yet if he boasts in his own strength, and sets at naught the counsels of God and follows after the dictates of his own will and carnal desires, he must fall and incur the vengeance of a just God upon him. D and C 3 colon 4. It is clear to see that men can be condemned for living it, or not living it. Thus, in our dispensation this law of plural marriage was revealed to Joseph Smith, because he and others were righteous and were bound by the law of the priesthood, which is the guiding force in how the law of plural marriage should be lived. This principle is not for the entire world, but is an eternal priesthood law, obedience to which distinguishes the saints from the rest of the world. Quoting from a sermon by George Q. Cannon. In every civilized country on the face of the earth the seducer plies his arts to envelop his victim within his meshes, in order to accomplish her ruin most completely, and it is well known that men holding positions of trust and responsibility, looked upon as honorable and highly respectable members of society, violate their marriage vows by carrying on their secret amours and supporting mistresses, yet against the people of Utah, where such things are totally unknown, there is an eternal and rabid outcry, because they practice the heaven-revealed system of a plurality of wives. It is a most astonishing thing, and no greater evidence could be given that Satan reigns in the hearts of the children of men, and that he is determined, if possible, to destroy the work of God from the face of the earth. The Bible, the only work accepted by the nations of Christdom as a divine revelation, sustains this doctrine, from beginning to end. The only revelation on record that can be quoted against it came through the prophet Joseph Smith, and is contained in the Book of Mormon, and strange to say, here in Salt Lake City, a day or two since, one of the leading men of the nation, in his eager desire and determination to cast discredit on this doctrine. Unable to do so by reference to the Bible, which he no doubt, in common with all Christians, acknowledge as divine, was compelled to have recourse to the Book of Mormon, a work which on any other point, he would most unquestionably have scouted and ridiculed, as an emanation from the brain of an impostor. What consistency? A strange revolution this, that, R.E.N. should have recourse to our own works, whose authenticity they most emphatically deny, to prove us in the wrong. Yet this attempt, whenever made, cannot be sustained. For Brother Pratt clearly showed to you, in his remarks the other day, that instead of the Book of Mormon being opposed to this principle, it contains an express provision for the revelation of the principle to us as a people at some future time namely that when the Lord should desire to raise up unto himself a righteous seed he would command his people to that effect. Plainly setting forth that a time would come when he would command his people to do so. It is necessary that this principle should be practiced under the auspices and control of the priesthood. God has placed that priesthood in the church to govern and control all the affairs fairs thereof, and this is a principle which, if not practiced in the greatest holiness and purity, might lead men into great sin. Therefore the priesthood is the more necessary to guide and control men in the practice of this principle. 
There might be circumstances and situations in which it would not be wisdom in the mind of God for his people to practice this principle, but so long as a people are guided by the priesthood and revelations of God, there is no danger of evil arising therefrom. If we, as a people, had attempted to practice this principle without revelation, it is likely that we should have been led into grievous sins and the condemnation of God would have rested upon us, but the church waited until the proper time came. And then the people practiced it according to the mind and will of God, making a sacrifice of their own feelings in so doing. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. He has helped us this far. He has helped us to conquer our selfish feelings, and when our sisters seek unto him he helps them to overcome their feelings, he gives these strength to overcome their selfishness and jealousy. There is not a woman under the sound of my voice today, but can bear witness of this if she has tried it. You, sisters, whose husbands have taken other wives, can you not bear testimony that the principle has purified your hearts, made you less selfish, brought you nearer to God and given you power you never had before. There are hundreds within the sound of my voice today, both men and women, who can testify that this has been the effect that the practice of this principle has had upon them. I am speaking now of what are called the spiritual benefits arising from the righteous practice of this principle. I am sure that through the practice of this principle, we shall have a purer community, a community more experienced, less selfish, with a higher knowledge of human nature than any other on the face of the earth. JD 13 201, 205, October 9, 1869 The spiritual benefits that Canon speaks of were explained by Jesus to his apostles when he said, Many shall come from the east and west, and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Matt, 8.11 he doubt that monogamists will have such a seat or feel comfortable in such company. The Lord did not condemn Abraham or Jacob in the Book of Mormon statement, only David and Solomon. Everywhere in the Bible and Book of Mormon, Abraham is honored and revered, but never chastised for his polygamy. Furthermore, the Savior stated that, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, when ye shall see Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets, in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves thrust out. Luke 16 verse 24. Strange that Jesus would honor Abraham and Jacob, two polygamists, if they had lived their lives in such a sinful way. Conclusion. These statements prove that men can live holy principles worthily, or they can fail and live them unrighteously. Judas Escargo was condemned, not as an apostle, but when he failed to live worthy of this calling. So also David and Solomon were condemned, not while they were obedient to the Lord, but when they failed. Plural marriage was never intended to be a principle that all men could live. Furthermore, it never will simply, because most men are incapable of properly fulfilling the obligations of even a monogamous marriage. It certainly stands to reason that if men like David and Solomon, who gained the respect of both God and man, were capable of failure in their marriages, then we know that any man can fail. Indeed, we may conclude by saying that only a few shall ever qualify for exaltation.